All right. I think um, I think we're good to go. We have uh, a pretty sizable part of our, our audience already in the room uh, at the moment. So I think we're pretty much ready to kick off then. Well, um, good evening and welcome to our event, Engaging with an Assertive China, a discussion with the Wall Street Journal. My name is Xiao Kai Fan, and I'm the president of the Columbia Alumni Association of Singapore. And we're really excited to bring to the Columbia community what I know will be a frank and fascinating discussion on China with some of the leading journalists who cover it. Uh, we're also delighted to be joined by digital subscribers of the Wall Street Journal as well. And needless to say, China's story will be a, a big part of humanity's story this, this century, from economic and geopolitical rivalry to pandemics and lockdowns, China will undoubtedly dominate headlines for many years to come. And in fact, I'm speaking to you tonight, not from Singapore, but from Taiwan, which I'm sure will be a topic that will come up at some point tonight as well. The Columbia Alumni Association is thrilled to be able to work with the Wall Street Journal to bring you insights from journalists who have experienced China, including several Columbia J School alums. And to facilitate the discussion, I'll now hand you over to tonight's moderator, Yumiko Ono, the editor, News Operations APAC at the Wall Street Journal. Yumiko, over to you. Ciao, hi, and thanks so much to the Alumni Association for having us today. It's great to have so many people in the audience from <laughs> Singapore, where I am based, and also from the region and around the world. Um, there will be a Q&A session at the end of this. So please, if you have a question, put that in the chat box and we hope to get to that at the end. Also, this session will be recorded. So for those people who have missed it, um, they'll also have a chance to catch up later. I wanna introduce my colleagues who are the panelists. Uh, Patrick Barda is the Asia Enterprise Editor based in Bangkok. And he manages featured projects across the region, including a lot of the China stories that you may have read or seen on, um, on the website. He's also a Columbia Journalism School alum. Uh, next to him is Niharika Mandana. She is the Southeast Asia Bureau Chief based in Singapore. She leads a team of reporters covering the region and also a Columbia J School alum. We'll be turning to her for her thoughts on what a more assertive China looks like from the perspective of the countries that she covers. Next to her is Josh Chin. He's the Deputy China Bureau Chief um, of the Wall Street Journal, now in Taipei. He oversees coverage of China news and China's impact on the world outside its borders. He was in Beijing for many years until the Chinese government expelled him and a number of other reporters in 2020. So these are the panelists. I want to start off by introducing um, each of you by, you know, if you can introduce yourselves, um, I hear that this is a question mm -hmm. that is always asked in the Columbia Alumni Association events, which is how has Columbia or other schools you've attended influenced your career today? And I will start off, I'm not a Columbia grad, but you know, for me, um, school has made me even more eager to get out of school, I have to say, and join whatever there was in the real world. So I started working for the journal um, while I was a senior. I went to uh, school in Japan, but I really wanted to see what was out there. So that's what um, the influence of school on me. But uh, Patrick, I'm going to start with you. Uh, you can hear me. Okay. Right. Yep. So I'm supposed to say that it was the, the most invigorating experience of my <laughs> Okay. Um, I, I'm, I grew up in the U.S. I, I grew up in Dallas and I went to the, to the J school, the journalism school. And uh, at the time I was working for the Dallas Morning News, a local newspaper and had a job offer in a suburban bureau and didn't want to do that. I wanted to be overseas. And, uh, you know, the, Columbia was really, really crucial and broadening my perspective and introducing me to a lot of international students. It was a big international push there at the time. And I remember studying with a professor and Terry Anderson, who had been an Associated Press uh, reporter in Lebanon, and he, some on this call may remember, he was taken into captivity for almost a decade, and so he was a really well-known person, and he would describe to us in class about how he used to do, he'd get up in the morning and play tennis with diplomats, Singaporean di diplomats, and Russian diplomats, and Chinese diplomats, I just thought that was so cool, like I wanted that life, and then I realized that, you know, actually what my life in Bangkok is really like is I go to Starbucks in the morning, like, uh, everybody else does around the world. But um, Columbia did play a really big role in helping sort of get me to that position to be uh, an international journalist, which is what I wanted to be. 
Hey, great, thank you. Niharika, what about you? So I also went to the J school, perhaps a few years after Patrick. Um, <laughs> the J school did add uh, a lot of value in terms of craft and connections and a bunch of other things. But the one funny thing I remember is that before going to the J school, I was a lawyer, which means my brain needed to be rewired to think like a journalist and stop thinking like a lawyer. And that was a lot of things like, you know, lawyers are by definition partisan actors, journalists are by definition non-partisan actors. But a funny thing was that as a lawyer, I was accustomed to speaking in interminably long sentences and writing in interminably long sentences. So a lawyer will throw at a sentence every punctuation known to humankind. You know, you want a comma, you want a colon, you want the semicolon, the M dash, the M dash, everything to delay kind of the inevitable full stop. And the first thing you learn when you go to J school is one idea, one thought per sentence. No, it doesn't sound like a big deal, but it was like pulling teeth, that shift in writing from one way to writing to the other way. And I remember a professor at the J school who would edit stories in print, uh, in red ink. Um, one of my early stories had like these parallel strikes against a paragraph long sentence. And uh, her remark was, this is a five incher. Um, it's a bit anachronistic now because what she was referring to was the length of that sentence in an actual newspaper or magazine. It would have been five inches long in print. Um, but I did over the course of the year manage to bring my sentences down to half an inch, uh, which has been handy um, through my career. The J schools help to shorten your sentences, Niharika. That's great. Thank you. Among other things. <laughs> okay, now Josh, over to you. Yeah, I think you're on mute. Sorry, you think years into a pandemic, <laughs> I would have figured this out, but um, uh, evidently I did not go to a good enough school. Um, I did, I did go to, a, I did go to a grad school. I went to um, the journalism school, Berkeley, so the Columbia J School's uh, rival. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it had a huge impact on my life. Um, I mean, actually, at the time when I had gotten into school, I was. I was sort of torn between a career in in uh, in cooking, uh, culinary career, and and journalism, and and the uh, the J school. Getting into the J school sort of pulled me back to journalism. Um, I think, thankfully, uh, for my for my own health and and mental well being. Um, I think that says more about how tough it is to be a chef than anything else. But um, but uh, no, I mean, the Berkeley being a journalism school. Um, the main thing that did for me was was expose me to a bunch of different ways of doing journalism um, that you just you kind of don't get or, or hard to get when you're working. Um, and this was when I was there it was kind of the beginning of multimedia journalism and Berkeley was really, really into that. And so I was able just as a matter of course, I mean, I was a long form writing student, but I was able to take you know, uh, classes in video and radio and photo and, and everything else and um, and actually that got me a job at the journal because later, uh, you know, a year later I was in China um, studying Chinese, trying to find a way to stay in China to cover the Olympics and was about to get kicked out because um, um, uh, my student visa was ending and, and, you know, the Wall Street Journal's video editor called me up because he had gone to Berkeley uh, and he had called the Berkeley Journalism School asking if they knew anyone in China who could speak Chinese and do video and I could do both at the bare minimum, uh, but the combination was enough for uh, for me to get uh, hired and I, I stuck around, so. Great, thank you. So it sounds like school really we did have a big influence on all of our careers, uh, one way or another. So I want to introduce uh, the topic of the day. Um, the emergence of a more assertive and confident China is something we've been covering closely over the years, whether it's been the trade war or the military buildup or whatever. I want to start today by talking about an issue that's under the spotlight right now, which is China's zero COVID strategy. So this is a very different approach from many other places in the world. And the lockdown in Shanghai and parts of Beijing and other cities and supply chain disruptions have also had a huge impact on the rest of the world. So I wanna start off by um, talking about 
what's behind this strategy and what it says about China and then what it means for the rest of the world. So Josh, I want to start with you. Catch us up on what's behind the strategy. You know, why is China doing this um, when most of the other parts of the world are not? Right. So, yes, yeah, so I think in China, I think currently or it's somewhere around um, there are 45 cities or so. These are a few dozen cities with about the total of about 300 million people uh, that are now under full or partial lockdown, which is pretty remarkable at a time when almost everywhere else in the world is, is <laughs> living with the virus. Um, obviously, you know, the most dramatic example, is, as, as, as you said, um, with Shanghai. Um, I'm sure everyone, most people here are pretty aware of it. You've had, you know, sort of mass food shortages, um, people being dragged away to centralized quarantines, even if they're asymptomatic, that dystopian like robot dogs with megaphones sort of telling people to stay inside. I mean, it's, um, it's, it's just really, really quite amazing. Um, and they're, yeah, they're, I mean, they're essentially trying to wipe out a virus that a lot of public health experts say is unwipe outable. Um, it's just so, you know, because it, it, the Omicron uh, variant of COVID just spread so so quickly and partly they're doing it um, because they have no choice. Um, uh, there's, there's just a really harsh reality for China is that they have a, an incredibly low vaccination rate amongst the elderly. Um, and, um, and then, you know, even those who are vaccinated, most of them, all, practically all of them are vaccinated with, um, with Chinese vaccines that aren't quite as effective um, as, as some of the mRNA vaccines that, that um, people elsewhere have taken. Um, and there are, there are a variety of reasons for that. There's a lot of um, distrust of vaccines amongst elderly people in China. They, they don't trust. There's been a few vaccine scandals. Um, the, go the government also seemed to be a, a little bit complacent um, after they initially got the the um, quarantine under control, so they didn't necessarily push as hard as maybe they should have to get people vaccinated. Um, you know, in terms of uh, the vaccines themselves, they, you know, they, there was this kind of nationalist story in China that, you know, that, um, you know, the Communist Party didn't, they didn't want to rely on foreign vaccines. They wanted China, they wanted China to have their own vaccines. Um, and they, um, uh, they had an opportunity to, to, to import uh, Pfizer, the BioNTech vaccine, and they haven't haven't done that yet. Um, and so I think, like with a lot of things in China, I think it kind of boils down um, to the to the power of a political narrative. Um, uh, you know, Xi Jinping, Chinese leader, has spent you know almost two years selling China's approach uh, as the superior approach, right? As the as the correct approach to COVID. Um, and you know, the this is the message that's gone out through you know all the state media on social media and he's just really been been hammering that message um and in some ways it's it's he's kind of trapped by that now he can't really back down um there's a major political event the 20th uh communist party national congress which is coming up uh this fall where he's expected to take a, a sort of unprecedented third term uh as head of the party and um and you know the the feeling is that he you know he really can't he's sort of trapped now he can't if he backs down now at this point it kind of weakens him going into that event so so it looks like it's going to continue for the foreseeable future then even if yeah i mean it's i mean you talk to public i mean there's a lot of public health experts in china who who want to who want to kind of move to a different um a different model but you know even they will say you know with the way the vaccination rates are in China, like any sort of loosening like that is going to result in, you know, sort of massive, you know, massive deaths potentially. And that's just, you know, that's it's something that the Communist Party really isn't, um, isn't, isn't eager to see and, and, and they're unwilling to sort of import um, kind of more effective vaccines uh, still at this point. So, you know, until they're ready to do that, it's, it's kind of hard to see how they'll, how they'll get out of this. So, okay. So Patrick, you've edited a lot of stories about you know, the Shanghai lockdown and the impact and um, what are some of the things that sort of strikes you as, you know, um, surprising or memorable about all this? Well, I, I don't I don't know if I'd use the word surprising um, because, you know, as Josh pointed out, I mean, this is um, I mean, I think, you know, this it, it just shows the, the degree to which Xi Jinping wants to, to really dig in on his policy. This has been in place for two years. Um, you know, I think that the implications of it for the world are, are worth talking about a little bit. And, and you know, I, I think we talked earlier about a story that 
I worked on over the weekend that basically argued that China is entering a recession. And, you know, with the exception of one quarter in early 2020, uh, in the first phase of the pandemic, China hasn't really had a recession. You know, if you go back decades, potentially, depending on how you look at it. Now, we're not talking about um, a, a, a recession yet in a traditional sense that Western economists look at, where you say two consecutive quarters of contraction, although I think we're getting to consensus or close to consensus this quarter will probably be contraction. There was some really negative uh, data out uh, today, just today on the services sector in China being incredibly weak, which is not surprising given the, the controls. Um, but I think that, you know, at minimum, we're talking about something what we call a growth recession, which people who, you know, uh, live in the developing world are familiar with. It's a term that you use to describe an economy that's no longer growing at its potential and it's not creating enough jobs. We are seeing a lot of young people in China frustrated that they aren't getting jobs. Um, you know, a, a couple of things that I wanted to add to this is that, I mean, I just want to be careful to not judge what China's doing. I think that there may be a tendency, uh, particularly among, you know, Western um, commentators to say, oh, well, we told you so, you know, uh, China's getting what you know what what we all got, and, and and there's almost this implication it's what China deserves, you know, because of this stubborn policy by Xi Jinping. And and look, that may be you know that may be the right way to look at. It. I don't know, but it is also true that a million people have died, I think, in the United States roughly, and and that has not occurred. So, judged just by by you know the loss of life, China's policy has been more successful. That's not to to you know uh, overlook the the suffering that's happening right now in in Shanghai with people. I mean, we know a lot of people and have quoted them whose relatives are in quarantine and they're 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 facing you know terrible situations. Um, but but all that aside, I think that ultimately what this this tells us is that that when when China decides it wants to do something, particularly when Xi Jinping decides he wants to do something, he means business. I mean, he's not going to back down. He's willing. Even to 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 you know to sacrifice to, on some level the economy in China. Now, it'll be interesting to watch. I think that we're starting to see some of his economic some of the policies get rolled back, and he's got some other things, a property crackdown, which we talked we could talk about later in China, and the crackdown on tech companies. Some of those policies that are being rolled back because there's concern that the economy is entering as recession potentially. So it may be that that Xi Jinping has to to backtrack or backpedal to some degree. But I think again, ultimately, what it tells us is that that when he decides he wants to do something, we've seen this with, with Hong Kong policy, we may see this with Taiwan policy, which we're gonna talk about, I think a bit later, he's a leader who fully intends to follow through with what, what he's saying he's gonna do. And that is, I've been in Asia for almost 20 years, that's a big difference, you know, compared to the, the Hu Jintao era, when you often felt like, well, you know, if they start to unnerve foreign investors, or there's enough global criticism or enough domestic criticism that, you know, they'll, they'll retrench. That's not the way that Xi, Xi Jinping operates. Oh my gosh, okay. But um, just back up a bit here. And when you talk about the recession, the you don't mean the two negative quarters because the IMF is saying, you know, they're saying what, four point something percent, right? So even so, even if the numbers are not negative, it's the impact in the economy. If you look at jobs and, you know, the economic activity, it's something akin to a recession or a- Yeah. Okay, okay. So if you take a country like India or Indonesia, other countries in, in Asia Pacific, you know, India, if India is growing at two or 3%, that might look good to the United States, which is accustomed to growth right. at that pace. But in India, that is really a recession because mm -hmm. India has to grow, I'm making this number up, I don't know what the right number is, but six, seven, eight percent a year, just to create enough jobs to, to provide employment to this large group of young people who are coming of age. Now, China's economy is a bit different. It doesn't have as many young people. Every country is different. But the point is that um, China at two or 3% growth for the year, if we get to that, or even 4% of the year, probably will feel like a recession to families on the ground. They will be frustrated that they, they don't feel like they're, they're moving forward. Um, I, I don't know where China, China's gonna wind up for the year. IMF, as you mentioned, I think is saying 4.4%. Uh, Chinese government is saying five and a half percent. I think a lot of economists are becoming more skeptical that even 4.4 percent is possible. And I think that actually some do see two consecutive quarters, quarterly contractions uh, coming from this. Um, that's not the consensus right now. But the bottom line is that it's a very, very weak economic situation in China, even if they do register some positive growth for the year. Okay, well, 
I mean, that must have huge implications for the rest of the world. Niharika, what are the countries that you cover? How do they look at the, the way China's you know, going and the economic impact so far? So I cover Southeast Asia, which is close to China. Um, obviously, when an economy the size of China starts to hurt, you see the ripple effects across the world and particularly in the neighborhood first. So one of the kind of direct ways in which Southeast Asia has felt um, zero COVID, and, and this is also an example of how extreme China's policies has been, have been, is the disruption to cross-border trade. So countries in the region like Myanmar or Vietnam um, have robust, usually pre-pandemic, robust um, land trade uh, with China, trucks and trucks filled with goods, um, perishables, non-perishables, whatever, um, move from these countries to China every single day. Now, what happened over the past year is that China decided that it was worth either closing border checkpoints or slowing traffic through border checkpoints significantly in order to lower the chances of the virus hitching a ride in um, on somebody on the truck or, or even... Uh, even the produce itself. I mean, you know, uh, Chinese authorities have said that they're worried about the virus being found on food packaging, on fruit packaging. Entire supermarkets, entire neighborhoods have um, been uh, impacted when uh, authorities have thought that um, a contaminated sort of uh, piece of fruit or shipment of fruit has arrived in a particular location. So the level of caution and the level of um, steps taken to avoid that kind of scenario have been extreme. So for Southeast Asia, it's meant that, that those usual conduits for cross-border trade have either been closed or so painfully slow moving um, that they have been effectively closed. Um, and we did a story a couple of months ago um, looking at this whole thing through the prism of one category of products, which was fruit, um, right? This is a perishable product that if it sits um, in a crate, in a truck for uh, two weeks, it's going to be unusable. Um, and it's going to cause uh, economic pain to the traders that are involved in that uh, business, to the farmers that produce those products. Um, uh, it's interesting to note that Southeast Asia and the agricultural production in Southeast Asia has grown enormously in the large decade, just supplying to China's growing uh, middle class. So as China has gotten richer, its appetite for things like fruit has grown exponentially so that, for instance, from Vietnam, you have a billion dollars worth of dragon fruit going out every single year, and 80% of that goes to China alone. So when China decides to close its border, you can imagine the number of people and the extent of economic damage. So that's just an example of how Southeast Asia has felt the direct impact of this. Another kind of long-term consequence to point to is that China's undertaken this effort, also pre-pandemic, to uh, fence off its southern border, uh, which is about 3,000 miles, um, and it's quite porous in a lot of places. So it used to be, um, and still is, in a, in a lot of places that uh, there was a lot of uh, illegal activities, so smuggling and human trafficking, that sort of thing, but also a lot of just kind of small informal trade and a lot of people-to-people -people contacts and exchanges, the kind of thing that uh, border communities survive and thrive on. Um, and so China, uh, several years ago, kind of launched this program to start building border fences to, to stop some of this movement, to stop some of this activity. Um, and it, it wanted to make the border more manageable. But that was a relatively slow moving program. Through the course of the pandemic, um, uh, governments locally and nationally uh, have just kind of supercharged that effort. So you're seeing fences go up um, much faster almost every day along that border area. And sometimes they have the kind of surveillance equipment that you see in a lot of Chinese cities. So they have, you know, cameras uh, in some places, even face recognition software. Um, and this has been, obviously, this has huge impact for uh, border communities. So um, while, uh, while these measures are justified, um, uh, citing the pandemic, because you want to, uh, the government say we want to, and it's been on a war footing, governments have said, you know, it's worth 
the, the economic sacrifice of walling off the border um, is worth it to prevent COVID-19 from kind of leaking, leaking through. Um, but the, the, the fencing is going to outlast the pandemic, yeah, obviously, sure. and it's going to affect uh, border trade, border life um, uh, in, in more permanent ways. Wow. And, you know, in the story, there were pictures of the fences and it, it looked quite astonishing just to see miles and miles of the barbed wire and fences um, going up. So this obviously has, you know, a lot of impact on the neighboring countries as well and all over the world. I want to get next to what does all this mean for foreign businesses that are or want to do business in China? And I'm sure a lot of people in the audience you know, work for companies that do already do business in China or with China or are considering. So it, it's a topical question. Um, for a while, Patrick, you've mentioned in the past that there were, you know, there were uh, people who were saying that for foreign companies, they had great ambitions and then they were disappointed and now they're going back. But um, there's some, uh, there's a story recently about the American Chamber of Commerce saying that foreign companies are less optimistic about investing in China, but is it that easy to, you know, is, is there a choice here or is it easy just to pick up and leave? It, the short answer is no. And, <laughs> and that's the dilemma, you know, that, that a lot of companies these face. I mean, I'm, I'm probably a bit more in the skeptics camp about, you know, this idea that, that, that everyone's going to, Pull up stakes and leave China, and it will have you know they talk people talk about reshoring, you know the supply chains are all going to move back to the United States or Europe or wherever, you know consumer brands are going to bail out. And, and look, I mean it's hundred percent true that that some companies have left China, um, and I you know I could go through some of the names, and it's particularly true I think of smaller businesses um, that don't have you know Nike will stay because Nike's got the the you know the 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 scale and the size and it's got the lawyers and it's got the lobbyists and it's got all the the, the, the you know, um, uh, it's got a lot of agency in China. It has a lot of influence there. But if you're a small business, you don't have that. And so, you know, if you're feeling pressure, you're feeling, you know, you, you're getting in trouble with the government or in some city or whatever, you might just pull out. Um, you know, look, I, the problem for a lot of companies is that China is still the world's number two economy, and it might become the world's number one economy, you know, in our lifetimes or even in the foreseeable future. Um, and, you know, where else do you go? You know, if you're if you're a consumer company looking for a big market opportunity, where else do you go to match that? If you're a, a manufacturing firm trying to source, if you're Apple, you know, Apple is trying to diversify its supply chain, but ultimately it still has to rely on, on China. Um, and there was an interesting um, you know, Goldman Sachs report that I've cited in a number of um, uh, places where they, 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 they surveyed a lot of companies and they asked them, are you planning to reshore or are you gonna plan maybe to do something else? And they all talk about reshoring, but almost none of them are actually doing it. What they're doing is doing things like, well, we're maybe diversifying on the edges, you know, like if we're going to, we need, we need 5% more capacity, we'll keep all of our stuff in China, but we'll add that additional 5%, you know, in Mexico or, or Bangladesh or something like that. Um, look, on, on, on the margins, companies are going to have to be looking for, you know, other places to do business. And I think, well, but I think more importantly, I think what they're going to have to really do is start accepting the in pricing in the challenges of staying in China. That's going to mean probably lower profit margins for a lot of products, both for consumer brands, things you sell there, but also things that you make there. And also it's going to mean, I mean, for, for lack of a better word, just more hassle. You know, it's a very, um, it's a very toxic environment in a lot of cases, um, not just in China, but also in the United States. And, you know, I just last thing I'll point out is like, particularly for financial firms, you know, Wall Street firms, you know, they're actually the, the, the group that's seeing the most opening in China right now. They're seeing the financial sector liberalized in China. China is beckoning and welcoming, you know, financial firms to come in, particularly to help China develop its, its retirement fund, pension industry. Um, and BlackRock and others are racing in. They're being criticized in the United States by senators who say, oh, we shouldn't be doing business with China. So, you know, you may feel pressure in China, like H&M, these brands that have, you know, raised concerns about human rights, et cetera. And then they face these social backlashes, but you're also going to feel the social backlashes in the United States because of the, the you know, consensus, really political consensus right now that 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 China is a, a strategic rival or perhaps even even enemy, you know, on some level, um, and that puts companies in a terrible, terrible position 
but where else are you going to go? So I think it just means that you've got to, you know, basically brace for more turbulence and figure out a way to, to muddle through it. And what are the, Josh, what are the um, Chinese companies or the Chinese government requiring foreign companies to do more and more? Um, they have tougher, tougher and tougher rules, don't they? Yeah, they, I mean, they do have, um, they do have a lot of tougher rules. Um, I mean, it kind of, it varies a lot industry by industry. I think, um, you know, the overall, I mean, part of the overall sort of thrust here is that, is that, you know, Xi Jinping um, really wants China to be more self-sufficient. And, and the sort of background of this is, is, is conflict with the U.S., right? Um, uh, you know, there's this, this idea of de decoupling that sort of took, took hold, particularly under the Trump administration, has continued under, under Biden, this idea that, that uh, the two economies are too tightly wound, um, that American companies shouldn't be supporting China's rise, is really sort of spooked. The Communist Party, um, you know, the, the U.S. has cut China off from various supplies of really critical technologies, including chips, uh, made it hard for U.S. companies to sell those to, to China. And so China, you know, Xi Jinping and the, the rest of the Communist Party, they really want China to sort of develop all these industries on their own, be, be self-sufficient. It's a bit of a kind of a throwback um, to, to an earlier era. And, and so as a result of that, they're, they're just... You know, there were all these, there used to be all these enticements in the sort of early years of the reform and opening up period to bring foreign investment in and foreign businesses in, and they would get tax breaks and they would get help from the government. And, you know, part of that was China wanted tech transfer. They wanted to acquire technology. Um, but now a lot of that is going away. Um, instead, they're, you know, companies are being saddled with, with, with extra requirements, bureaucratic loopholes they have to, they have to jump through. Um, there's also a political element to this. So, you know, uh, uh, Patrick mentioned H&M, um, you know, there's, there's sort of all sorts of political litmus tests, right? You know, if, um, you know, so for like clothing companies like H&M, you know, Xinjiang cotton, right? So cotton, this is, you know, cotton produced in, in, in Xinjiang, which is, you know, this region in, in Northwestern China, where there have been uh, allegations of forced labor, um, you know, you, as a company you used to be that you could sort of just not say anything and kind of keep your mouth shut. But now, you know, not only is it activists and, and, and you know, others in, in the US and, and sort of, um, you know, human rights groups sort of asking, you know, American companies to take a stand, but so, so is China, right? Um, and so, and it's, and it's just, and the, the, also the environment in, in China, um, you know, public opinion wise, there's a, there's a really, the nationalism, levels of nationalism are extremely high, particularly online. Um, and so, you know, companies that, that, that step wrong, that are sort of perceived as insulting China in some way can find themselves in the, in the sort of middle of a firestorm really, really quickly. Um, so, so the challenges have just really been multiplying, I think, for, for foreign businesses there. I want to go back to the supply chain issue for a moment. And Niharika, you actually looked into um, how companies actually take their supply chains out of China and to other places and how it's quite challenging, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so my impression of this kind of supply chain shifting or diversification or China plus one strategy, as some consultants call it, um, is similar to Patrick's in the sense that a certain percentage of the supply chain, no matter what industry you pick, for most industries, is moving out of China and has been moving out of China for quite a while. And the reasons have been different at different points in time, right? It was rising Chinese wages at some point. Um, it was the trade war uh, a couple of years ago. Now it's COVID. Um, but a wholesale shift in supply chains um, that means companies picking up all or most of their supply chains and saying, we're packing up from China, it's too hard, we're gonna go elsewhere, um, is not happening. And when I was in Vietnam trying to figure out how companies were trying to do this, I kind of saw why it's not happening. It's really, really hard to do. Um, so there's two things that I learned, and obviously some of these things are industry specific, but um, in general, um, one of the takeaways that I had from that reporting experience uh, was that the things that we consume and the things that we can name are made of dozens and dozens of other things that we can't name. Uh, so a, a product, meaning you pick, you pick a product like a, a consumer product, you know, electronics product, a mobile phone or an industrial product like an industrial pump, which was the product that um, I uh, happened to um, be looking at when I was in Vietnam. They're made of 
50, 60, 70 little pieces and parts that need to be procured, put together for that final product to then be exported, right? And, and so the second takeaway was that the reason China became so attractive in the first place is create this ecosystem where you're able to draw all of these parts through tiers and tiers and tiers of suppliers who know how, who over 15 years, obviously, the China store, you know, for over the last two decades, um, have figured out what parts are required, how they should be made, what certifications are required, et cetera, et cetera, so that you have all of this kind of bunched up in one place. And if you're the final, you know, the importer in the US, the company that's ordering this product, it's pretty neatly tied up uh, in China. As they started to move things out of China, looking at the supply chain, you kind of have to break down the supply chain and say, what can we move? Uh, because it's not like you can move all 80 parts to be manufactured in Vietnam. And if you went to Vietnam to make the final product, you wouldn't find that ecosystem um, of the of kind of the whole of this part and that part and this paint and that widget and that certification. And you'd have to start from scratch, kind of cobbling together that whole system, which not only is time consuming, expensive, but actually impossible to do because it, it's just, those suppliers aren't available in Vietnam. And recently, actually last year, Vietnam, uh, the, the government of Vietnam did a study on this. Um, so this story that I'm describing is a couple of years old, though uh, the picture remains pretty much the same. So the, the Vietnamese government did this study and found what they call the localization rate is quite low. And what that means is that when a foreign investor sets up a factory in Vietnam, the ecosystem of local suppliers to help that foreign investor, that foreign factory make what they want to make doesn't exist to the extent that you would want it to exist. So they found only 10% of most foreign companies that are making things in Vietnam rely on local companies for parts. So what this means then is that you have to get parts from China to assemble something in Vietnam, or you have to convince your Chinese suppliers to move with you. So if you were big enough, uh, you tell all your Chinese suppliers, look, we're moving to Vietnam, uh, hitch a ride with us. And if it made sense to the Chinese suppliers, they would or they wouldn't. Uh, but in most cases, you're not big enough to pull that kind of thing off. So then inevitably, you're importing, say, 60, 70% of the product from China, assembling it in Vietnam, and then exporting it to your overseas markets. Anyway, long story short, not easy. Okay. I mean, there's too many parts, it sounds like, and it's too complicated. That's, that could be why, as Patrick says, people are talking about doing it and it's so much harder to do. Um, I want to move on to, you know, we talked about how much more difficult it's getting for foreign companies to engage uh, in or with China, but you have to. Um, there are not a lot of alternatives. And for our business, for foreign journalists, things are getting tougher too. Josh, I want to turn to you. This is um, something... Um, question from the audience um, as well, but, you know, can you talk about your experience in China and what happened in 2020? Um, right. Uh, um, yeah, so I was, I mean, I, I spent about um, 13 years, uh, maybe a little bit more, maybe almost 15 years altogether um, in China in various stints um, as a journalist. Um, and uh, all that came to a very swift and unexpected end uh, at the beginning of, uh, of uh, 2020, right, right when the uh, pandemic was um, sort of gaining steam, actually. Um, I had sort of, at that point, I just started my current job, which is, a, a, you know, deputy bureau chief, and started sort of doing a little bit more editing of stories and that sort of thing. Um, and um, at the time, what had happened was the the, Wall Street Journal had opinion page, which which is completely separate from our news operations, had published a, an opinion column with a headline um, that had described China as the real sick man of Asia, um, uh, which a lot of people in China um, took offense to, um, and uh, including the Chinese government. Um, and so this this kind of evolved into a bit of a dispute, and and um, and I won't get too deep into that. But the, suffice to say that um, neither side really backed down. And 
uh, in February, they called the our bureau chief uh, into the foreign ministry. Um, uh, his visa was coming up at the time, actually. So I thought I thought that that maybe they were going to tell him that his visa was going to be delayed or shortened or something like that. Um, uh, and instead, uh, he came out of the office and um, he's kind of face was a little bit pale. And I was like, what, what happened? They, they kick you out. And he said, no, they kicked you out. Um, and so, uh, which was really shocking to me. I was, I've been joking when I, when I asked if he'd been kicked out because they, China has not expelled any journalists since, um, at that point they hadn't outright expelled any journalists since like the 1990s. Um, and they hadn't expelled multiple, so he expelled me and two of my colleagues, um, uh, one of whom was in Wuhan at the time reporting on the pandemic. And they had not, um, China had not expelled multiple reporters from, from the same news organization um, since the Mal era. Uh, so it was a total, it was a complete shock. Um, and, and it kind of heralded this, this new era that the, the US government sort of responded in kind kicked out some some Chinese, um, some employees of some Chinese news organizations. Uh, then China turned around and essentially ejected all of the American reporters from the New York Times, the Journal, and the Washington Post, uh, which I think was, I can't remember, not quite 20, but it was, it was quite a few um, reporters altogether. Um, and none of those people have been able to go back. Um, and so um, a few of them have left China reporting. A bunch of us have stuck around and kind of doing it from from the periphery now. But I do want to add that um, we do have a global China Bureau now with people in the region and in the US and, you know, all over. So, OK. All right. Um, it's also becoming more difficult for the reporters who are there. But it sounds like there are, you know, there are some positive developments as well because um, the Chinese government granted a visa for, for a handful of new reporters recently. Um, okay. All right. So moving on to international relations. And um, I actually have a question from the audience that I wanted to toss in here, um, which is, and I want to ask Patrick this, is it inevitable that China will overtake the U.S.? <laughs> Um, in what sense, I guess, in an economic sense or in a military sense? There was, sense? Um, well, let's say economic. Uh, well, I'll say, I'll, I'll, I'll actually answer both. Um, mm -hmm. I, no, I do not think, I don't think anything is inevitable. Um, and, you know, one thing I've learned in, as, you know, being a journalist for 25 years is uh, things rarely happen the way that you expect them to. So I think a lot can can derail that now, um, but I think that the the, per, the person asking the question is, of course, on to a, to something that's you know an important point, which is that um, you know, the the Chinese economy is uh, this year notwithstanding ascendant, um, and it also is becoming um, clearly clearly a much greater military power. Um, um, and just in the time that I've been in Asia, it has moved from being you know I think the fourth or fifth or sixth largest economy in the world to being the second and having the ability to project military power kind of nowhere <laughs> to potentially being able to project military power across all the, all over the region. And, and Naharika may talk about this a bit, you know, um, I mean, you now see China being able to, to utilize port facilities uh, basically all over the world. I mean, they can project power across the world uh, in a way that I think is, is not even fully understood by a lot of people. But I guess, I, you know, what I would say is that, you know, going back to my original point, that things don't always work out the way you expect them to. I mean, you know, uh, um, one of the narratives in China is that the United States is is on the descent. Um, it's a it's a it's a dying power. And that could be you know, that, I think there's a lot of evidence actually to support that argument. And it could be true. Um, but, you know, part, if you look back to, to the last couple of years and the, the times of the pandemic, um, there was a lot of, you know, finger pointing at, well, look at race relations in the United States, look at the incredible, you know, political divides in the United States and, and just how, you know, how angry people are and the fractiousness. And, and, and I think a lot of people in the United States would tell you that that is actually part of the strength of the American economic and political system, that, that the United States is able to, um, to navigate that, those kinds of tensions without them being bottled up. 
and progress and its institutions survive. Um, and I think that whether the United States winds up being a declining power or not, I think that will be the, its, its innate strength. Um, and that is an innate weakness, I think, of the, of the Chinese system potentially, because as we're seeing in Shanghai, there's clearly a lot of unhappiness uh, being expressed in social media and elsewhere, but it's also being censored and contained. And is that sustainable or not? I don't know. Um, um, we could go on, I think, about some of the weaknesses in the United States. I don't want to, in no way, I want to suggest that I'm picking sides here. I think that, um, you know, a, a lot of the strengths that people look at in, in the Chinese context, particularly in economic context, are, um, are, are, are very robust. Um, you know, uh, uh, a, 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 not a young population anymore, but, a, you know, still an incredible number of young people coming out of schools with engineering degrees. Um, you know, we look, one of the things we look at a lot right now is, is this sort of race to, to see who can develop, you know, faster um, chips and microprocessors. And the United States clearly has a lead in that right now, but China is definitely catching up. So I think just purely on an economic basis, um, you know, China is clearly catching up and, and is on, on a trajectory to surpass the U.S. economy. Again, the question is just whether the political systems in the two countries um, accommodate um, China's growth and whether or not that ultimately leads to some kind of conflict between the two or if something happens within China to slow down its progress, as we're seeing this year in the case of, of COVID. Martha, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I was just uh, thinking as Patrick was speaking about the, um, about how China's development and China's rise is perceived in the region that I cover, the countries that I cover. So China's size, proximity, and China's economic heft make it a really important partner to Southeast Asian countries. Um, China's size, China's proximity, and China's heft also make it kind of a scary partner to these countries in Southeast Asia because economic might translates into military might, and this is kind of what Patrick was alluding to before, um, that China is able to project power um, in more definitive ways, much farther and farther away from its shores than before. Um, for Southeast Asia, which, you know, it's, it's kind of from China's perspective, it's the, it's the near abroad. But if you look even at just that domain, at, at the South China Sea and how China's uh, rise has changed things there and China's uh, military expansion has changed things there, you now have these kind of um, artificial islands that have been militarized over the past decade. And for a long time, it was sort of confusing as to what China would do with them and how far it would go to develop them and how would they enhance Chinese capabilities and all of this stuff. Um, but one of the things, one of the kind of real concrete ways in which it's allowing China to um, uh, project power in the region is just to be present uh, across the South China Sea for much longer periods of time um, through a much larger fleet of naval, coast guard, and militia ships. So initially, you'd have to send, if you look at the map, you'd have to, if you were China, you'd have to send a ship or, a, uh, you know, a naval ship, a coast guard vessel from, say, Hainan um, to the Spratlys to patrol. And then you'd need to resupply and refuel and your sailors would need rest and all of that stuff. So you'd make that long hike over and then the long hike back and the whole thing would take very long and you couldn't spend too much time around the Spratlys, which are disputed. Um, a lot of the Spratlys are disputed islands with uh, with Southeast Asian nations. Now you have these artificial islands that act as bases really far away from China's shores where therefore you can make a stop and continue to patrol, come back quickly, make a stop, continue to patrol. So the result is that Chinese patrols in Southeast Asia are uh, ubiquitous, are um, uh, very, very strong to the extent that, you know, obviously Southeast Asian nations, which uh, have smaller, much, much smaller fleets and, and a smaller ability to do the same thing, um, feel that they're unable to match that kind of uh, strength. So, um, so in some ways, China has uh, changed, changed the picture in the region um, in that way. Uh, the other way for Southeast Asia that's, um, that's kind of impactful is how the China-US dynamic is playing out. Um, 
So it's kind of an escalatory situation where China's rise uh, has created this kind of bipartisan hardening uh, in, in the US of the view towards China, which in turn now in China has created this impression of being besieged perhaps by US, uh, US public and political opinion. And all of these events uh, for, for Southeast Asia um, are, are anxiety inducing because you really, the last thing that these Asian countries want is, is, uh, is a conflict, either economic or military between these two powers and to be caught between the two powers, uh, having to do the one thing that, uh, you know, Prime Minister Lee of Singapore has said repeatedly that the region doesn't want to do, which is to pick sides. Um, so yeah, look at it through those two prisms. I also want to get to um, Taiwan and Josh, I want to ask you this, um, especially because of the war in Ukraine, Russia, and how that all affects, you know, China's thinking about Taiwan. Um, a lot of people are talking about it. Uh, what have you, uh, what have you come away with? I, yeah, I mean, there certainly is. A, there's a there's a lot of talk and, and speculation. I think it's mostly speculation um, at this point uh, because nobody really knows uh, the mind of Xi Jinping, and he's you know ultimately he is the he's the the person who will decide how China responds to all this. Um, you know the the you know it, it's always sort of a little bit treacherous to 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 make predictions. Um, clearly, both China and Taiwan have really have been taking a lot of lessons. From Ukraine, I mean, obviously, one of the big lessons um, for China has been to watch the 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 way in which um, most of the the sort of G20 economies, the biggest economies in the world, really banded together um, to impose sanctions on Russia. I think that was that was surprising to a lot of people, and I, I'm sure that that um, caught the attention of people in Beijing. Um, I mean, China's got a much bigger economy than Russia's, and it's it's a different economy, and so maybe be less vulnerable in some ways to that sort of action, but it's certainly the sort of thing that 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 um, that, that made that make people in Beijing sit up and take notice. Um, you know, the resistance, the, the, the level of resistance by the Ukrainian military um, in, um, in the war and their, their ability to sort of resist a much bigger and much better equipped uh, army uh, is something that I think China noticed and Taiwan has noticed. Um, I think you know people in Taiwan. There's a there's a ton of discussion now about um, about Taiwan's the necessity of of, of fighting um, an asymmetric battle if China does invade. And there's no there's no indication right now that, that China is planning to evade. I should just say that um, off the bat. But in the in the event that it does, you know, I think for a long time there was people in Taiwan in the military were sort of you know there was a lot of debate about what the best approach was. And I think now the Ukraine has sort of crystallized that, you know, asymmetric warfare, the sort of, you know, the, the sort of use of the the kind of shoulder fired missiles that you saw, that you've seen so much in Ukraine, the anti-tank missiles, that sort of thing um, is, is, you know, is, is probably the way that Taiwan wants to go. Um, and uh, of course, you know, Taiwan and, and, and the situation in Taiwan is very different from Ukraine and, and people in Taiwan will point that out often, you know, Taiwan is an island, first of all, um, which is both good and bad in the sense it's, it's good that it's harder to get to, um, you know, uh, it, it's bad and that it's harder to escape for, for civilians. Um, uh, and, you know, and then on the Chinese side, you know, China's military is much better, is even better equipped and larger than Russia's and, and better financed, but it's much less experienced. Um, and, and so I think, you know, this is, this is another point of discussion for a lot of people looking at the potential conflict there is that, you know, if even the Russian military, which has been fighting conflicts uh, in Chechnya, it had a previous invasion of, Crimea, you know, the annexation of Crimea. If even the Russian military is having logistical problems and mounting an invasion like this, uh, what might happen to, to China's military, which hasn't, hasn't fought a conflict since 1979 and, and which it lost, so. On the uh, question of Russia, um, we are running out of time, but I wanted to squeeze in one last question from the audience. And Niharika, this is for you. How close will the Russian sanctions bring China, India, and Russia together, both politically and economically? It's a hard one to answer very quickly, but I'll throw it to you anyway. Yeah, it is a hard one to answer. I mean, from China's perspective, uh, the whole situation has created um, a difficult dynamic with Russia. There's various different 
kind of norms and interests all kind of competing with each other. So, um, uh, you know, in, in to the extent that China and Russia are partners uh, in all of this, the, the sanctions issue um, is uh, is going to saddle. It's going to be uh, a liability. I think India kind of stands a little bit differently in that they're uh, they have um, not joined the West in imposing sanctions on Russia or participating in Western sanctions for reasons that uh, Russia and India have been closed for many, many years going back to the Cold War. Um, but there's very little chance that that's going to bring India closer to uh, China, for instance, with whom uh, India India's position towards China has become more and more antagonistic in recent years, um, not least because of the hard power conflict uh, in the Himalayan region. Um, so I think it's a it's a difficult situation for at least for China and India to navigate the various kind of interests. Um, um, and it, it will have kind of different impacts uh, depending on how long this this whole thing lasts. Okay, so we're running out of time here. I'm going to hold, uh, hand it back to Xiao Kai in a minute, but I really think that, you know, we've, um, there was so much to discuss in this hour that we can go on for much, much longer. Everything from the COVID, zero, uh, zero COVID policy and the whole impact on the global economy, on China's economy, to geopolitics, and we discussed a little bit about our own situation, but it just seems to be that, you know, this is a, um, we cannot not engage with China. And that seems to be the takeaway from each of these um, topics that we discussed. And uh, okay, so with that, uh, on that note, I'm gonna hand it back to Xiao Kai. Miko, thank you so much. And thank you to the panelists for that really detailed discussion. Um, before we conclude tonight's session, I'd like to just make a few brief announcements of some of our own clubs upcoming events. I'm sure everyone in Singapore is sensing the giddiness in the air right now after the latest easing. So we're thrilled to announce our first in-person happy hour in over two years on Thursday, May 12th at Sugar Hall on Cecil Street in the CBD starting at 6.30 p.m. And to toast our very, very long awaited reunion, the first drink will be on the club for all members uh, of the Alumni Association. And then separately on Wednesday, May 18th at 6.30, we'll be hosting a fireside chat with Ming Ma Group President of Grab at the SG Innovate Event Hall on Carpenter Street near Boat Key. And Ming will be sharing his insights into innovation and an evolving tech landscape. Tickets are free, but uh, the event is open to members only. You can find all the details of these events and everything else about the Columbia Alumni Association of Singapore on our website, which I'm putting the link to right now in the chat. And I'd like to once again thank Yumiko, the panelists, and everyone at the Wall Street Journal for sharing your time and insights with the Columbia community tonight. As you said, Yumiko, China is a complex and Byzantine story, and I, I hope that tonight's event was able to shed just a little bit more light for everyone. So thank you all once again, and good night. <laughs>